chapter 5, verse 43, says, You have heard it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. <laughs> Nothing like letting the flesh turn loose. But I say to you, love your enemies and bless, and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain upon the just and on the unjust. So, Father, we just thank you for your word tonight. Lord, we thank you that your spirit uh, has prepared our hearts and that we are going to receive from you nuggets from heaven. Lord, we're going to find pearls. We're going to find good things. And you're going to help us and teach us tonight. And everyone said, Amen. All right. So tonight we're looking at Jonah, heaven warns, because, you know, we learned this, when especially, uh, well, we've, we've seen it several times, but, the, you know, the Bible says that surely God will do nothing except that he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. And, and uh, a lot of people think that God just does whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to, and, that, and that's not what his Bible says. It does not say that. It says that he tells somebody first. Amen. Now, a lot of times we don't listen very good, but he does tell. <laughs> so, uh, and, and what happens with us sometimes is, is we move against God, sometimes willingly and sometimes ignorantly. So, to, to move, one way to move against God is to deny the presence of what the Spirit of God is wanting to do in, in the earth. And there's a lot of that that happens. So, you know with, with Jonah and Nineveh that God wanted to warn Nineveh of a coming calamity. And because Jonah didn't like his enemies and didn't want his enemy to be blessed and didn't understand the concept that God was that God is love and he doesn't want anyone to perish. So he's trying to he was trying to go the other way and we you know and then he got thrown in the water and a fish come along and swallowed him and then spit him back out where he was supposed to be to begin with. Sometimes you know sometimes we think boy God it'd be neat if you'd just spit me out at the right place, right? But then you're going to smell like fish. <laughs> so but but God wanted to to warn Nineveh, and uh, next, not, well, not next week, but the next time, we're going to find out why he wanted to warn Nineveh. But basically, it's just the fact that God loves everybody. Christ died for the world, not for Christians. He also died for Christians, but he died for everyone. Amen? Amen. So, because Jonah didn't want to do the will of the Father as given to him by the Holy Ghost, he ran off in the other direction. A lot of times, I've watched this happen over and over again throughout my ministry. God will say something to someone, and they do a 180. Pew, they're gone, man. They don't want to do it. I even have a relative, one of my brothers, he stopped going to church because, you know, there's no secrets in the body of Christ. There's, you know, there's a knowing of what God is doing. We may not be able to pinpoint or be real precise all the time, but there's a, there's a knowing. And people kept walking up to one of my brothers and saying to him, aren't you supposed to be a pastor or something? And he, he, he didn't like it. And he quit going to church because of that. Ridiculous, isn't it? Well, we say that, but you know, we say, but then we have to admit, have we ever done a 180 when God said, I want you to whatever? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, Jonah has run away, and now God's got him back where he wants him. And, and uh, we, we jumped over to chapter 2, but in chapter 2, uh, you know, when a, when a fish swallows you, you come to your senses in a hurry. Because you're going to die if you don't do something right. And so he begins to pray, and he begins to magnify God. And when he gets done with his prayer, the fish goes, okay, spits him out. That fish must have been awful fast. Because, you know, when he got on the ship, more than likely he was in the Mediterranean Sea. And in order to get to Nineveh, you have to go all the way around and come up the other side. You have to go around Africa and, you know, fast fish. He was in there for three days. 
you know, maybe prepared more than just the belly. God is the God of the miraculous. So, so uh, Jesus said that the rain falls upon the just and upon the unjust. And sometimes we look at folks and we think, you know, they're kind of mean and ornery and all that, and they seem to be doing okay, or maybe even sometimes they look like they're doing well, and we think, you know, God, I'm trying to serve you, I'm trying to follow after you, and, and this person over here, it just seems like, you know, everything they does is like hitting the lottery, and, and how come this ain't happening to me? The rain falls wherever it's going to. And I don't, I don't believe in luck. There is no such thing as luck. That, but there is a, be, such a thing as being in the right place at the right time. But that's not luck. That's just what's going on at the time. You know, like, think of all of us. We're born in, in the only nation in the world where you can completely, freely worship God. And that wasn't luck. That's a, a design of God. Well, I could say something right now. God has so blessed our lives to live in such a wonderful place, we shouldn't squander it. Amen. So, let's go back to Jonah. So the rain falls wherever, you know, if you're under the cloud, you're going to get hit. (laughs) Rain's going to come down. So we overcome evil with good, and the power of heaven overcomes the forces of darkness, is what we've been looking at. The power of heaven overcomes the forces of darkness. Say the power of heaven heaven. overcomes. Overcomes. Amen. So Jonah chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Truthfully, you know, we shouldn't need a second time. But, Said to him, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach it, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. And, and remember we learned about how, how big a place Nineveh was. It's 60 miles across. So that means that you know there's a few million people there. And God's telling uh, Jonah, go to this really big city and walk across it and tell them, you know, the end's coming pretty soon. Kind of like them guys that stand on the corner. You know, ever seen one guy with a placard or a piece of cardboard? The end is near. <laughs> That's what God told him to do. Go out there and tell everybody, y'all are going to die. <laughs> yeah, that's what I want to do. Sign me up, God. So he arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three-day journey in extent. So in other words, you know, 60 miles, three days. If you walk across, it'll take you three days. And Jonah began to enter into the city on the first day's walk. And he cried out and said, Yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. So God always sends a messenger to warn people of the plans of the enemy. Now, you know, most of you have been around here long enough that, that you know this, but it bears repeating anyway, that God is not our enemy. God is not trying to hurt us, destroy us, bring calamity upon our lives, you know, bring uh, what people look at in the Old Testament and say, well, God's judging this and God's judging that. The judgment that God makes is I can't stop it. Smile. See, you know, you know, people have the idea that God brought all, God brought sicknesses and plagues and all that. Well, if that's true, and when we get to heaven where God's will is unrestricted, it's going to be really bad. <laughs> but He doesn't have any of that stuff up there. If He doesn't have any of it up there, how could He have it down here? Good question. If He doesn't have any up there, how can He have it down here? If He doesn't have any up there, how can He have it down here? Because what happens a lot of times, people hear things and they just kind of roll with it, you know. Preacher says something, must be true. (laughs) Amen. But what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to take the Bible to interpret the Bible, not just what somebody thinks, including me. That's right. 
I'm a human being just like you. I can miss it just like you. I'm <laughs> I want to play right there. I'll do it anyway. I'm less prone than some folks, though. To <laughs> you're off course. All right. Okay, so let's look at John real quick. John chapter 8. So God warns us to save us and to reveal himself. I, I was reading something the other day. This just kind of fits right into this deal. Uh, uh, a well-known minister, he was saying that what America needs is, is to have like a, uh, I don't remember the exact expression he used, but what America needs is to have a really dramatic, like a head-on collision with God. Something that is so powerful and so real that you cannot deny it. And, and what a lot of us want to do is we have we want just enough God that we feel good. Now I, I've talked to folks where you know they, they, they go to churches, and I, I'm not I don't pick on churches, but this, this is just true. You go to some churches of God there, you can't tell it. You know, you, you just can't. There's just no presence, nothing going on there. Amen. And, and and I've talked to folks that go to churches like that, and I, I question them. I don't question why they go there. I say, what happens when you go there? They say, it makes me feel good. Hmm. And then what? What do you mean, then what? I feel good. No, no, no. There's, there's people dying and going to hell. We need to do something about this. Oh, we do? Okay. So John 8, verse 44 says this. You... Let me back up just a second before I read this. So, the enemy plans to hurt, you know, John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes not for to steal and to kill and to destroy, right? So everything that the enemy does to us is wicked, bad, hurtful, harmful, okay? So, so Jesus gets in a confrontation with these guys, and they're going around and around with him, and so then he just tells them who they are. Verse 44. You are of your father the devil. How'd you like to hear that? Yippee. I was wondering where I came from. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And the desires of your father you want to do, for he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. You know the devil has resources? It's a bag full of lies. For he is a liar and the father of it. So the only resource that the devil has is to lie. A lot of people have signed power to the devil and say he can do this and he can do that. And, you know, like some people think he has the power to make people sick. No, he can't. All he can do is lie to you till you believe it and then it comes on. Amen. There's all the sickness come from the devil. One way or another, he caused man to fall by lying to him, right? And then by lying to folks, he gets them to buy into, into the deal of, you know, you're getting this or you're getting that or you're going to. Like I'm one lady, I, I tried and tried to minister to her, trying to get her healed. She had cancer. And she finally told me just before she died that uh, she said, I've always known I was going to die of cancer. I just didn't think it would be this soon. She was 43 years old. That's pretty young. I'm like, oh my God, you know. Listen to something. And she'd been listening to it for a long time. All of her adult life, she said. And would say it. I'm going to die of cancer. <laughs> Sometimes you wonder, why, you know, why would somebody swallow something like that? So, so the only resource the devil has is to lie. You remember when, when, when Jesus was confronted by the devil in the wilderness? All the devil did was lie to him. If you do this, I'll do this. He's lying. If you do this, I'll do this. He's lying. All he's trying to do is get Jesus to believe he's going to do something. Okay? So lies are always destructive. They don't help. 
and and the peop and the people of Nineveh believed the lie that God's people need to be removed. You know, there's still people in the world that believe that God's people need to be removed. You know, like most of the people that live around Israel, modern day Israel, they believe that Israel needs to be removed. God's people need to be, you know, taken off of the earth. You know, there's a whole religion that is dedicated to removing God's people. It's called Islam. They want to get rid of them. And and so, you know, the devil the devil's tactics haven't changed. And people haven't changed. It's just, you know, the same old lie. So it is the plan of the enemy. This will help you out here now. Because remember Jesus said that, you know, when people come at us, we're supposed to bless and not curse and pray for them and all that sort of stuff. It is the plan of the enemy to remove God's people. You are God's people, right? Are you God's people? Some of you are looking at me like, well, maybe. No, you either, you either is or you isn't. Are you God's people? Okay. All right. Just, you know. Okay, so it's the plan of the enemy to remove God's people. The reason why the enemy wants to remove God's people is because that is where the blessing flows from. When God's people agree with God in the earth, then God does things. Amen? And because God does things, and it messes up the enemy camp, when we, do, when we, when we pray, when we bless, when we do what God wants us to do, it destroys the works of the enemy, and he doesn't like that. They, he, whether we do or not, he don't like us anyway, because every time he looks at a human being, it reminds him of God, and he doesn't like that. We're made in his likeness and in his image, right? So every time he looks at a human being, he's like, I'm going to get them. So, th so this will help you out. When people come at you, and let me explain, let me, let me, let me uh, set this in order for you, okay? When people come at you, some people come at you just because the enemy's trying to get at you, okay? So when people, blah, 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 whatever they say to you, you need to understand there's something behind this, so, and don't take it personal, okay? What is our reaction to be? It depends on what they are doing. Okay, so Jesus said, if people come at you for my sake or for the gospel's sake, then you get to take one across the cheek. We don't like that. What do you mean I get to take one across the cheek? Remember the, one of the first things that happened in the book of Acts after Jesus left, the disciples were taken in and they, they threatened them and everything and then they beat them. And the disciples came out of there happy you know, rejoicing because they were worthy to suffer shame for his name. Most American Christians go, shame? Mm. Why would we want to do that? I don't like being shamed. Well, you're over here in this camp now. You know, where, now I don't mean shame like you did something dumb. That's your fault. Okay? What I mean is when you do something righteous, and you get whacked for it. Okay? So when you do that, you get one across the kisser. That's just the way it is. Say amen. Now, if somebody's just coming at you because they're just wanting to come at you, that's not for the gospel or for Jesus. They're just being ornery. Is it the devil behind it? Probably. But in that case, you can go stop or something bad's going to happen. Amen. Okay, you know, and, and do we have a right to defend ourselves? Yes, as long as it's not for the gospel's sake. You know, you come bust into my house, you're going to find out how good a shot I am. And I'm a pastor. A pastor can do that? I'm a really good shot. <laughs> not just kind of, okay? And, and, and do, I, do I get concerned about that? No, I post angels out around my house. I'm not concerned about it. But, you know, there are those things. So our, our mission is to preach and to warn people of the coming judgment. So let's go back to Noah again. Chapter 3 and verse 5 says, So the people of Nineveh believed God. Wow. Imagine that. Can you imagine walking into a city saying, You're all going to die and revival hits? Now, some of you aren't going to like this. 
every ministry has a purpose of God, whether you like it or agree with it or not. You know, like there is a ministry in this that originated in this city, well, not this place, but in this, in Prescott. And those folks like to stand on the corner of bullhorns and yell at you and tell you you're going to hell. And I've heard, I've heard ministries and pastors and Christians say, them folks are wrong, they shouldn't be doing that. And, and I would agree with you that there may be a better method. But sometimes, you know, according to Pastor James, you've got to scare the hell out of people. And they get people saved. We should be rejoicing in that. Now, would I like to pull them aside and say, hey, you know, that maybe not the greatest way to do that. Yeah, I'd like to, but I'm not going to do it because it ain't none of my business. We have no right to judge another man's servant. Another pastor is a servant of God, right? So who's the other man? God. You want to judge your servant? You go ahead. I'm going to leave him alone. Amen. So, okay. So, he's preaching and they're, and they're going, ah! So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and satin ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let not man nor beast. Boy, they're serious about it. I mean, it's one thing to tell people, but, you know, say, don't even feed your animals. Wow. Let not man or beast taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is, that is in his hand. Who can tell if God will turn away and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Woo wee! Preach the message, warn the people, for God desires to save. Listen, there is nothing wrong with telling people in a strong way, you ain't going to make it if you don't straighten out. I have a, I have a good friend that I went to high school with in, in I, w I went down to a meeting in, in the San Diego area where he lived. He said, why don't you come and stay with me? He has cats. If I'd known he had cats, I never would have done it. <laughs> I'm just not a cat person. That's all there is to it. I'm just, no. Anyway, but so while, there, while we are there, and this guy has a lot of money. He's a multimillionaire. He sells about one house a day in San Diego. That's a lot of money. Okay, so, I mean... He, he used to run around in a Rolls Royce, but he got tired of people staring at him at intersections. You know, he'd pull up in a Rolls Royce, and people would like, that, you know. Is that a rock star? Is that a movie? Well, who is it? You know, he got tired of that, so he went back to the Mercedes, because nobody cares about Mercedes in California. So anyway, so I'm staying at his house, and he's telling me about, he's done, he's, he's done this, you know, nice thing, you know, fed some folks, and he's put money over here and put money over there. And he's, he's saying, you know, that I want to start a boys ranch, you know, help out these boys that are in trouble. And, and you know, just, I said, how are you going to do that if you don't even know God? How are you going to help them? Well, you know, they're you know, straighten them out and all that. And I said, yeah, but they'll come out of there and, and, you know, you'll be able to fix some of them. And I said, according to everybody's statistics, the success rate on, on boys ranches that don't have a religious backing with it, in other words, it's a godly deal, the success rate is about 20%. Isn't that kind of like throwing your money away? He didn't like that. And, and so he kept trying to persuade me that he's a good guy. I said, listen, dude, I've known you my whole life. You don't have to tell me what you're about. And what I said, you know, I like you. You're a good guy as far as that goes. He goes, but what? Now, his mother was a godly person. She was, she was a Baptist, and she, you know. I know she prayed for them boys because they're both honoring all get out. That'll get a mama praying. It will. And so, uh, you know, I, he, I don't know about his dad. I don't know if his dad ever made it. But anyways, so he's, I'm walking out of the house one evening. I'm going to one of these meetings, you know, it was minister's meetings that were going on. And he's following along behind me and he's wanting to know. He's wanting to know. And I go, what? He goes, I want to know. 
where do you where do you think I'm going? Am I going to heaven or hell? And I never said either one of those things to him. He just kept badgering me, you know. I said, don't ask me something if you don't want to know. I want to know. He was kind of upset. <laughs> I said, you ain't going to make it. You're going to split hell wide open unless you give your life to Jesus. You think so? No, I don't think so. I know so. What you going to do about it? He goes, well, pray for me. Well, I have been. Amen. But but warn them, tell them. You know, look what happened to these folks. They're they're all they're the enemies of God, and the preacher goes in there. See, God desires to save. Tell people there is no destruction. There is no destruction in heaven. And if there's no destruction in heaven, that whatever destruction comes upon them, it's not from God. Now you need to understand something when you're talking to folks. Because people assume that God kind of, a lot of folks assume that God's responsible for everything, which makes him responsible for a lot of ugly stuff in the world if that, that were true. But you need to tell them, look, this comes from the other camp. Now, a lot of times people get offended when you tell them the devil's working in their lives. What do you mean the devil's working in my life? Well, he's, he's a thief, he, he steals, he kills, and... And he destroys. And all that stuff's going on with you, so what do you think? If God does nothing but bless and help and, and love and all those wonderful things, then it can't be out of his camp. Where did it come from? But you got to tell people, if people are unaware of the need of a Savior, they will not give themselves to him. If I'm good enough, then why did Jesus die on the cross? I don't need that. Amen. But I'm not. I need it real bad. So do you. Say amen. amen. So, okay. Second Kings chapter 6. Second Kings 6. So how do we know what to do and when to do it? Now let me say this before we read some. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's six, Second Kings six eight through twenty three. It'd take a long time to get through all of that, and probably you know the story. But here's the difference between Old Testament and New. Under the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon folks. He didn't live in them. In the New Testament, it is the Spirit within. Any Christian can have direct contact with God. All you got to do is pay attention. Now, how do you pay attention? You pray, and then you be quiet. <laughs> as long as you're blabbering, he ain't talking. Amen. And, and, and so, you know, we and also in the New Testament, we have a tool that they didn't have in the Old Testament. We can pray in the Spirit. We can use our heavenly language. We can pray in the Spirit. And as we pray in the Spirit, God reveals, as the Bible says, that when we pray in the Spirit, that he reveals mysteries to us. What are mysteries? Things you don't know. <laughs> pretty simple right so he'll tell you things you don't know about but but so we can be warned of what the enemy is doing so let's begin here in, in verse 8 it says now the king of Syria was making war against Israel and he consulted with his servants saying my camp will be in such and such a place and the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying now the man of God is Elisha sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. So the king's making plans. You know, he's over here, way, you know, 150, 200 miles away, over here making plans, you know, telling his generals, this is what we're going to do, this is the route we're going to take. And, and, and the prophet in his chamber, he's, you know, he's communing with God, and God says, hey, this is what the Syrians are doing. They're taking this route. They're going to come down here. They're going to be here at such and such a time. And he'd send a message to, to the king, telling the king, hey, don't go out there, because if you do, the Syrians are going to meet you there, and you're going to get wiped out. So they, they would do something different. Obviously, if you know where they're coming from, you can ambush them. Right? They're coming down through the valley, you're up on the hills, they're in trouble. See? So, so these things, this thing is going on over and over again. 
It says, Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him, and he warned him, and he was watchful not just once or twice. So this kept happening over and over again, right? Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which, is, which of us is for the king of Israel? You want to know something interesting about our president? He has a prophet near him all the time. And if he doesn't understand something, he goes and asks the prophet, What do you think? And the prophet will pray, say, Let me pray, let me see. Sometimes they have an answer already. That's pretty awesome. So the enemy tries to ambush, and you know that's why you get those four in the morning tweets. <laughs> he, he ambushes them instead. Therefore, the heart of the king. Of, <laughs> so he said, "Which one is doing this?" And then one of his servants, verse twelve, says, "And one of his servants said, None, O my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. That'll upset you." I know what he's saying. First thing he's thinking, what did I tell that concubine? <laughs> you got to understand what these folks are like. Okay? <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> no, oh, oh, ooh, man. And what else did I say in there? See? You know, the church is going to return to the place where we respect the ministries that God has placed in the church. There's not that much respect for the ministers for the ministers right now. And, and there just isn't. You know, in in the day of Elisha, when Elisha would come walking, you know, towards your city or riding his donkey, whatever he was doing, he'd come towards your city, they'd send somebody out and say, What are you doing here? You know, are you coming peacefully? Like that's gonna stop something. It's not, but you know, because because whether they liked the prophet, the ministry of the prophet or not, they knew what it could do. See? And God is going to, there has been, there has been a lie brought into the church that in the last days, God's just going to use everybody in general and there ain't going to be no leaders. That's ridiculous. You can't get people, to, you know, it's like herding cats if you do something like that. They just run everywhere. There's always got to be leadership. The difference in, in the last day's church and the church that has been for a long time is the leaders are going to be very strong. They're going to know what the enemy is up to. They're going to lead God's people into the right place with the right equipment at the right time. And the battle is going to be over before it starts. We should know. We say, well, you know, in the early church they had this and that and they'd still get whacked. They were severely outnumbered. We're not. How many Christians are there in the world nowadays? A billion or so? According to estimates? We're not outnumbered anymore like they were. You remember, they, when they started, there was nothing. Nothing. You didn't have anybody on your side. Except for the few that were in Jerusalem, and that was it. And then they went out from there. Okay? So, so there is...